Good morning and welcome to the Biopharma in a New Era panel here at the SACS conference. I'm Stephanie Leuzon from Terea, um, and I'm very happy to host this panel. Um, what I'll do to start is just ask each of the panelists to introduce themselves. Um, so if uh, we take a few minutes to, to do that, perhaps Chandra, you could start. Yeah, sure. Uh, my name is Chandra Leo. I'm with HBM Partners. We are a Swiss-based healthcare investment firm, although right now we are probably more of a virtual investment firm in all sort of time zones and locations at the same time. Uh, and we are investing in both private and public companies. Uh, we have about uh, $2.5 billion under management. Uh, and uh, geographically, we invest in North America and Europe, but also in uh, India and China. Uh, and um, yeah, happy to join this panel and uh, speak about, uh, yeah, I think what, what uh, has started uh, as a shock uh, and then turned to be a sort of very productive year for us this year. Thank you, Chandra. Um, Valentine, could you take the slides off for the moment while we do the introductions? Um, Yi, would you introduce yourself? Sure, happy to. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Eve Wickmans. I'm a Senior Director of Business Development, uh, responsible for licensing transactions and M&A with um, Janssen. Uh, I've been 23 years with Janssen, and Janssen is the pharmaceutical business of uh, Johnson & Johnson. Um, Johnson & Johnson is currently the largest healthcare company in the world, uh, with Janssen as its pharmaceutical business being number one in the U.S. and number three in the world. Um, we're focused on three, uh, on six therapeutic areas, um, oncology, immunology, infectious diseases and vaccines, cardiovascular metabolism, neurology, and pulmonary hypertension, which is the business that I'm currently with. Um, as 50% of our products are sourced externally, we have an extensive um, organization and network trying to cover the entire um, landscape going from the uh, innovation centers worldwide that are covering everything which is research and early development over um, the business development organization which I'm part of covering the late stage products and our uh, JJDC which is our venture capitalist arm trying to take um, or participating and taking partnerships in um, new businesses and companies. Uh, happy to be here and uh, welcome everyone. Thank you, Yves. Uh, Kieran, would you introduce yourself, please? Yeah, thanks, Stephanie. Hi, hi everyone. My name is Kieran Rooney. Um, I head up business development at Amrit Pharma. Um, I've worked in the industry for longer than I'm willing to admit, to be brutally honest. Um, I've been with Amrit now for about four years. Amrit is a, um, I guess we're the new kids on the block. We are a relatively young company. We, we were formed back in 2015 as a, as a, as a concept uh, to build a, a new company in the rare and orphan disease space. We came out of stealth mode in 2016, acquired two companies at that, at that, uh, at that juncture. We, we became a commercial entity back at the tail end of 2016. Uh, when we acquired the European rights to a product called Lojaxta from Egerion Pharmaceuticals. We got to know those guys quite well. A number of our team had previously worked at Egerion. We got to know their advisors and uh, their investors uh, particularly well, to the point where um, at the tail end of, well, actually about this time last year, um, at 20, uh, September 2019, we actually acquired Egerion. So that took us from being a company with a single asset in Europe to being a, a global player with two assets on the market worldwide, um, excluding Japan. Um, somebody once said to me, we like to do audacious deals, um, you know, and I think that's, you know, that's kind of a, um, emblematic of, of what we like to do. We're building a, a, you know, potentially a really interesting business here. Uh, we, we still, um, while historically we've been very focused around being a commercial entity, we're still very much um, a development entity as well. We um, have recently read out, actually earlier this earlier this month, we read out the top line data for our, our EASE phase three study in EB or epidermolysis bullosa. This is the first time that there's ever been a positive readout in an EB study anywhere worldwide. Um, we're super excited by this opportunity. Um, you know, it's great news for Amrit, but it's also great news for patients. Epidermolysis bullosa is, is a truly hideous disorder. 
and uh, to be able to have the hope of bringing uh, some kind of um, therapeutic option to these to, to these patients is you know is 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 rewarding as a as a management team. So look forward to the discussions today. And uh, yeah, thanks for the time. Thank you, Kieran. Um, Sam, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Um, thanks for having me on the panel. Name is Sam Fazeli. Um, I've been a uh, biopharmaceutical analyst for uh, lost count now. Uh, it's a bit like Kieran, perhaps it's best not to say anything, but I think it's about 22 years now. I've been on the cell side uh, and I've uh, been at Bloomberg now for 10 years nearly, December is 10 years. And here at Bloomberg, we've built a product called Bloomberg Intelligence. Um, I run the whole Bloomberg Intelligence team in London. So we're about 70, 80 folk in that team. And um, we do research. That's how we're different to uh, the rest of uh, the Bloomberg uh, organization in terms of uh, <clears throat> uh, versus media news. We, we have opinions and we write research on companies and industries. And we're about 300 strong globally, 150 in the US, about half of the rest in Europe and the half of the rest in, um, in uh, Asia. And I take care of the European group. And I also do pharmaceutical analysis still. So I have two hats that I wear, <clears throat> neither of which I have with me today. And just for the avoidance of doubt, that picture in my background is not my home. Uh, <laughs> maybe one day, but not today. That's just one of the nice chateaus I recently visited in the region I live in in France. Thanks, Stephanie. Thank you, Sam. Gil, would you like to introduce yourself? And then maybe you could kick us off with a bit of an overview on what's been going on in the markets. Sure. Hi, and thanks for uh, having me uh, this morning. This also is not my home, um, <clears throat> uh, like Sam. But um, I, I'm uh, Gil Barnahum, I'm managing director uh, in the healthcare group uh, at Jefferies, based out of London. But uh, like Chandra, I think based out of a closet or a room these days, <laughs> some days without uh, much travel. Uh, I've been an investment banker now for about 20 years. So I'm trained as a biochemist. Uh, I spent some time as an equity research analyst in the United States. And then came up the ladder uh, in the U.S. biotech market. I moved to Europe uh, in 2008, and I've been focusing on helping biotechnology companies uh, in the development stage or just the commercial stage access capital, merge, acquire, and providing advice uh, really throughout that. Over the last, uh, let's say, 11 years at Jefferies, we've really built a great franchise of helping either public companies in, in Europe um, raise capital, um, like last week. We helped um, uh, a really exciting um, gene therapy focused hearing uh, company called Sensorian raise around uh, 31 million euros. <clears throat> um, that's kind of more on the smaller end of what we do to, um, let's say, mid-August. Uh, we worked with uh, Bank of America to take care of that public, which was one of the higher flying IPOs that was up about 300 uh, percent on the first day in, uh, in the wake of, of COVID. So great to uh, great to be here today in terms of the market. You know, we focus again on, on the European uh, continuum, and uh, there's been about a significant shift over the last several years, which I think we've been fairly instrumental in, in pushing to identify and access capital in the U.S. Uh, healthcare specialist market. And that's really a byproduct of, uh, you know, past 2008, the last financial crisis that we had. There are very few um, or, or not as many as there used to be investors like Chandra uh, in the market. Uh, certainly on, uh, in Switzerland or in the UK. And the real specialists, the long-term capital has really gravitated a significant portion of it to the US. So in order to really um, be able to, to raise the amount of capital that you need, I think a lot of the uh, European companies, either public or private, have, have gone to access uh, that market. In general, that market has been, uh, from a surprising standpoint, extremely robust this year. Uh, I can tell you that when my partners and I turned the corner in February and you know the music stopped extremely abruptly, we were all relatively concerned. And then four weeks later, we helped reopen the market with this Intalis IPO um, and then you know, several IPOs thereafter. What we saw initially in the market was really a shining star or shining light, uh, so to speak, uh, that, was, that was put onto biotech. A lot of the investment community, um, either having hedged themselves or not, uh, really looked around in March and thought, where can we put our capital? Um, are we going to put it back into the cruise liners, into the hotels, or should we rotate into healthcare? And we saw a significant amount of inflows uh, and growth really in the amount of capital that existed in healthcare. Uh, and on top of that, when you only have one transaction that's really flying a week and it's a biotech IPO, every investor on the planet 
takes a look at it, um, these transactions are all coming to the market with really fully subscribed books. And in fact, if you look at the 40 plus IPOs that have happened this year, 100% of them um, are in and above the range, which speaks volumes to the level of visibility that you have at launch. Uh, 90 plus percent of these uh, international IPOs or US IPOs um, have uh, executed crossovers. And therefore, as they come to the market with a self-fulfilling prophecy type transaction, i.e. our investors, insiders, and uh, investors that came into the pre-IPO round are supporting our deal, that creates uh, a ton of momentum. Put that on the back of IPO execution that's changed uh, really dramatically from the beginning of time, where historically you would be on the road for two and a half weeks, four meetings a day, black cars, onto a plane, logistics, etc. Now, my clients get a chance to sit in their offices or in their homes uh, for you know 12 to 15 hours a day and over a four-day period execute an IPO um, from their desk chair um, uh, through a Zoom platform where they can access investors. So, you know, we, we see that as really changing um, the face of how uh, IPOs uh, are really going to get done. A couple other things to highlight, the amount of capital that's being raised in each transaction is absolutely astronomical. In 2018, which was a really, really banner year and bumper crop for IPOs where there was 54 in total, and I think we're at 45 now with, with a lot to go still, um, we saw uh, you know, an average deal size, median deal size of about 100, 120 million. Uh, this year, the average deal size is around 210 million, right? Both on a median and a uh, average basis, which speaks, I think, volumes again to the amount of capital that's out there. Also, importantly, the transactions continue to perform. So the investment uh, community sees really a robust IPO platform, uh, and a lot of them are chasing a bit of those returns. Notwithstanding the fact that a lot of these deals are very tightly placed, you are seeing um, on, a, on an offer to one day about a 40% performance this year, where last year was around a 10% performance. So you're seeing a lot of momentum really drive and continue to drive that market. As we think about the uh, follow on market, you know, it's really catalyst based. I think there are um, wider discounts for companies that try to opportunistically raise capital. But if you come off some good data, we see, you know, again, a lot of investors uh, continue to flock to uh, very, very good science. So that market continues to be quite healthy. And the private placement market also, I think, is extremely robust. You know, the, the returns that have been garnered by the VC community over the last several years have enabled all of them to raise additional capital. And all of that capital is being deployed. Uh, and again, in fairly significant uh, transactions and a significant amount of capital is being raised uh, by private companies. So we were obviously very encouraged with the turnaround from this year. Uh, looking forward, I think, you know, everybody continues to talk about the election. Everybody wonders what's going to happen in 21. Um, you know, it's certainly a big enigma. I think, you know, if you look back historically, elections haven't necessarily been a massive um, hiccup generator, so to speak, for the market. And as a lot of the transactions come to market with real support, we feel that they should all still continue to do well. Uh, you know, obviously, we don't think people should go uh, hit the market on, on November 4th or November 5th. Uh, and let's see kind of how things shake out. But uh, by and large, uh, I think science is at uh, an all time cutting edge pace. Uh, and we're seeing a significant amount of capital returns into the market. So from we stand today, it's, it's quite healthy. Um, you know, my crystal ball gets a little bit foggy uh, beyond November, but um, that's a little bit of, uh, of the market. Stephanie, I'm happy to take some questions towards the end if there are other specific topics that we can talk about, but let me turn it back over to you, Stephanie. Thanks very much. That was, that was a great intro and setting the scene for us um, in the current environment. So our panel is entitled uh, Biopharma in, the, in a New Era. Um, so I guess that's probably where we should start and um, maybe talk a little bit about what people have been seeing sort of in the pharma sector um, before we move on to, to markets. What impact, I guess, have we seen from COVID um, in the sector overall? I don't know, Sam, uh, do you want to start with that subject? Sure. Um, I'll try and keep it as brief as possible. I mean, obviously, there was, um, um, I, I like the way Gil talked about the uh, February, or March, whenever it was, when everything just came to a halt. Um, we have a situation where um, uh, we've got, uh, we had companies who were entering into the space and it, we were all running around trying to figure out what does this mean for their business? I think one of the key areas we were all focused on was what does it mean for supply chain? Are drugs ingredients likely to be able to come out of China? How much is made in China? Who's most based in China? Because at the time we were all panicking that this is um, 
uh, a major China issue, but of course uh, it didn't turn out to be like that and it spread everywhere. So the interesting thing was that obviously a lot of companies suffered in the second quarter and a lot of that was due to the variety of reasons that are all mostly linked to the uh, lockdown situation. So folks couldn't get to, um, investors couldn't get to, uh, sorry, patients couldn't get to uh, doctors, doctors, uh, hospitals were fully uh, focused on dealing with COVID as opposed to um, uh, any elective procedures, et cetera. So what that meant was that you had a significant impact on vaccinations, on not cancer therapies. That was one class of drugs that mostly survived. Uh, but anything that required injections in the hospital, et cetera, kind of had a setback. So second quarter just basically told that story when it came to large pharma and biotech. They all had that issue. And of course, some clinical trials were halted. Or, or at least put on ice, even if they were in the middle of recruiting. And um, some companies took more drastic action than others. I mean, Lily, I think, generally stopped most of their trials. Um, and then, of course, a lot of that was recouped um, uh, when we came to where it is, is likely to be recouped when we come into the uh, uh, third quarter, because um, uh, there was pent up demand that, that just is going to fill back up again. So. In general, I think the, the interesting would thing would be what kind of lasting effect, effect it has on companies. Where they lost revenue and margin because of revenue uh, slowdown, they gained something in terms of the lack of expenditure on, um, on uh, Salesforce uh, driving around and, and spending money on that. Conferences uh, reduced in terms of costs, et cetera, which are significant. So a lot of that, was an in interesting uh, uh, situation where most companies managed to keep their margins um, intact during that period. So now, of course, we have the next uh, three, six, nine months to deal with. And, and I think pharma is um, looking relatively healthy in that space. The biggest question long term, of course, which I think is a subject of another panel generally to discuss, is going to be what happens with um, drug pricing in an, in an economically pressured world where we expect to see um, a meaningful uh, uh, recession in different countries. And of course, the, the noise that's coming out of the US in terms of the uh, drug pricing pressure. So I'll leave it at that. But if you have any anything that you think I should have covered specifically, give me a, let me know. <clears throat> okay, um, Yib and Kieran are two other uh, representatives from the industry side, do you have any other thoughts or comments on that subject? Well, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll go first, if you don't mind. Um, from the buyer side, um, it's for us pretty much business as usual. Uh, I think it was very remarkably to see how we, how quickly we adapted to the new way of working, as, as Jill already explained, instead of jumping on planes and meeting people all around the world and at conferences. We, we very quickly adapted to new way of working. And, and so far, I can say that for, uh, from a deal closing point of view, there, there's minimal to no impact uh, versus what we were doing before. Um, things like due diligence completely happen, um, digital and online. Um, visits happen through people walking around with cameras. And, and we've been closing deals pretty much around the, the same timelines as we were doing before. And it seems like the, we adjusted uh, together with, with the companies, of course, that, that we were working with very, uh, very quickly to, to this new um, normal. Um, it is true that most of the uh, deals that we've been closing this year have, are building upon uh, connections and, and discussions that already started. Um, before the, the whole crisis, the uh, COVID crisis started. So I think one of the challenges we're trying to work ourselves through now is um, how to best connect with, with uh, biotech, with, with companies who uh, we want to partner with. Um, as yeah, the, the, the partnering events are, of course, not happening. It's all digital now. Uh, but all of, all of that, of, of course, we're, we're going to have to reevaluate that in about six months or so from now, whether we get a new nice inflow but i think the so far so good it seems like the uh the, the sellers and the buyers try to have found a new way to connect and, and find each other uh so yeah nothing nothing earth shocking from from at least from our side on how we work in in this new era 
And, and Kira, maybe going back on sort of the operational side, just thinking about how clinical trials have evolved, you know, on the one hand, you know, uh, if you're not doing a COVID trial, there maybe maybe have been implications. If you are doing COVID trials, are there things we can take away from, you know, how quickly some of these things have progressed? Yeah, and you know, I echo much of what Eve said there, but you know, you raise a really interesting point there, Stephanie. You know, we we were conducting um, and have been conducting since 2017 the largest clinical trial that had ever been conducted in epidermolysis bullosa. And we were coming to the, the close of enrollment into that study, but we had a small number of additional patients that we needed to recruit into that study to hit our numbers. We, were, we, we had an interim analysis last year <coughs> and um, we were advised to add, add some additional patients into that to, 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 retain, to retain power in the study. So we were aiming for 230, which is a big number in a, in a, in a vanishingly rare condition. Um, however, COVID happens and you've got a relatively small number of patients that you haven't recruited into your study. So what do you do? Do you say, okay, guys, let's, you know, let's put things on hold for the time being. We don't know how long it's gonna take before we can actually go back into the field and recruit the additional patients that we need to bring in or do we go out there and get statistical advice based on the best knowledge that we we have of of what we have so far and you know these are really really tough tough decisions to make for a company you know this was this was our lead development asset um a lot clearly a lot hanging on it not only for amrit but also for patients as well so so we had to make that that tough decision um, we we believed it would probably take us an additional eighteen months to 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 and to enroll the additional patients into the study based on the fact that hospitals probably would be out for a minimum of a year. We wouldn't be able to get out into in into into hospitals uh, to work with 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 the investigators to recruit these patients. So we made that tough decision to to cease enrollment into the study, and you know it's it's played out positively as i mentioned earlier on we read we read out our our phase 3 study earlier which was which was you know the first time that there's ever been a positive result in a in a in an eb phase 3 study so from that respect it was you know we had you know really direct experience of the challenges associated with with conducting studies in in the area but i think you know clearly in the in in, in conducting um trials of vaccines it's you know it's 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 much more challenging where do you actually conduct those studies given the desire for you know for all countries to try and actually limit uh, the spread of of the disease so it becomes that, that in itself is a is a is a challenging question you know and one of the things that we've certainly seen post you know since the 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 ability to actually get out there and talk face to face with people in February, March time is that, you know, people, because they haven't been traveling so much, have spent a lot more time, <clears throat> to use that well-worn phrase, exploring strategic options, and that's taken on a new resonance. We found a lot of companies are, you know, spending a lot more time thinking about strategy, you know, what should they be doing strategically, what territories in the world should they be operating in, how should they, you know, what markets should they target? <clears throat> and I think that's created, you know, quite a lot of churn in the market and a lot of flux that's that's you know created opportunities for a whole bunch of, of companies out there um thank you does anyone else want to comment on you know because it's been pretty dramatic how quickly some of these therapeutics and even more interestingly some of these vaccines have gotten into clinical trials are there lessons that we can learn from those processes that you know could be applied to drug development more broadly I, I think uh, this one interesting development is that the industry is almost sort of putting the brakes on some of these uh, accelerations now with uh, some big pharma CEOs kind of taking their vaccine for approval and
Stephanie, you're on mute, I think. Oh yeah, sorry, sorry, thank you. I wasn't sure if that was my uh, my Wi-Fi or um, just a bad connection for a moment. Sam, did you want to add anything on that? You had uh, expressed some thoughts on that subject. Yeah, I mean, um, in terms of, you mean clinical trials and conduct of, of normal business in general? Yeah, because you had mentioned, you know, it's interesting to see how quickly some of these these vaccines had gotten into um, into the clinic, yeah. and is, is there are there things that yeah, I mean, to be adopted it's in other areas. Right, right. So uh, the, the, the you do have to wonder whether the, the the way that they've managed to do the work that they've done, in terms of the rapidity with which they've um, conducted the the process, is has been helped by the fact that we're dealing with a pandemic. So whether you can replicate that elsewhere, it's not easy to tell. But, you know, if you just look at the development of, I mean, there, there has been this general shift in, the, in, in shortening the time of drug development in general, right? So I could give you two examples. One pharma company has said that they have worked through their various processes and have been able to shave off up to a two and a half years of the normal development timeline of a drug. And that's not to do with COVID. That's just simply <clears throat> having been through the process, making sure that they've not got w wastage along the way in terms of time. A lot of it seems to happen going between phases. So then, <clears throat> then of course, you've got drugs like selpercatinib from um, Loxo Lily that essentially came to market within three years of entering, or there or thereabouts, of entering phase one. So that's incredible. But Obviously, that's for a highly specialized group of patients where they're very easy, relatively speaking, to identify, at least in a clinical trial setting. If you're going for a broad cardiovascular indication where you don't have a very obvious biomarker that you can select the patients with, you obviously have to have much larger trials and make sure that you've got the right patients. But I'm convinced that with COVID and with the general effort that pharma companies have been making and biotechs, um, so let's make say drug makers, that they are going to be able to shave some meaningful amounts of time off development pipeline uh, times, which of course is useful, especially if you're under pressure on pricing, because that gives you a longer economic life for your product relative to its patent. If you get that to market earlier, assuming you're not relying on data exclusivities, et cetera, for your product um, return then that really positions pharma companies to have a better opportunity to manage any ongoing drug price pressures. Okay, thank you. Um, we have traditionally on this panel talked quite a bit about you know, financing and, and what's been going on. Gil gave us a, a great start um, to that, but we thought it would be interesting to talk as well in a little bit more depth about sort of the impact on, on fundraising and um, I just had a couple of slides, Valentin. If I could, if those slides could be shown, and if we could go to the first slide just briefly, um, and then maybe we can speak more about that. This is just a, a, a looking at the Nasdaq Biotech Index. Um, this goes all the way back to 1993, and it's an interesting slide because it puts things in perspective, just to show, you know, how much value has been created over this, you know, long time period, which is. Uh, interesting. We did have, you know, the big drop in, fe in between February and March with sort of the shock of COVID. Um, but as Gil mentioned, the, the index was up quite a lot, um, you know, over the course of the year. And if I could just have the next slide. And then we looked at IPOs. Um, you know, there were four IPOs in March, one in April, none in May. And then suddenly there were 30 IPOs, you know, in June and August. So a very busy time all-time record volume, I think, raised. Uh, and then before Labor Day, um, the activity came to a halt. And I think, you know, deals are back on the road now. Um, but, um, and Valentine, if you could take the slides down um, and um, just stop the slides for the moment. Just in terms of, of all of that, you know, IPO activity, um, we Gil mentioned a little bit about the increase in, in appetite from investors. Um, what do you think has been driving that? I mean, usually when we have these macroeconomic shocks, uh, volatility, you know, when we're at sort of at, over the course of the year at all time highs, sort of in volatility levels as well. Um, do you want to talk a little bit more about what, uh, what has driven some of this unprecedented activity? Sure, I think a lot of it um, early on was a combination of 
really strong support for said company followed by scarcity value. So as I mentioned before, if you've, if you've got a deal that has uh, executed, you know, good series A, B, and C, has great investors that are going to support the IPO, then you do a crossover for 50, 60, 80 million bucks. You know, those nine, 10 investors are also going to support the IPO. You, you show up to the IPO market with a book that's fully subscribed. And um, for as long as we can remember, it's just been a bit of a knee-jerk reaction for the buy side, oh, okay, well, last time I heard the story of the book was fully covered and um, <clears throat> the, the deal was at <clears throat> this uh, valuation and it was pricing in four days with and without my order. Last time I heard that message that the deal was up 50%. So let me go ahead and participate. And I think that's been one of the aspects that continues to drive uh, the IPO market. As I talked about before, I think the rotation has a lot to do with, you know, where are you going to put uh, your, your money? Uh, as a generalist investor uh, or as a momentum investor. You know, I heard a, a quote the other day which said that, you know, in some places oil is cheaper than water, right? So um, with the supply demand uh, or the supply um, um, surplus that's going on on that front, you know, there was a time where gold was not behaving uh, necessarily in the same manner. And innovation in pharmaceuticals was at the forefront of all of the news. And I think you see that with a lot of the retail investors that are following and popping up a lot of the um, COVID, uh, you know, stocks, so to speak. So I think you have this real light that's been shined on biotech as a bit of a defensive industry in this, um, you know, really challenging consumer and retail um, driven investment community, where now you see, you know, real returns in an IPO market that you can't gain any place else. And I think that that, that shines a light on that, you know, for quite some time. Um, and, you know, we're thinking only now have we started to see it as the election gets closer. But there was very little thought that pricing uh, would be a real issue uh, or was an issue that was essentially taken off the table for some of the generalists in terms of farmer pressure and uh, making sure, you know, that the uh, company can make a significant amount of money uh, to substantiate the investment that, that has been made. Um, in terms of that being taken off as a risk in some of the generalist investors early on this year, a lot of them were able to jump in um, into the market uh, and look at opportunities, which historically they hadn't looked at. So I think it was a lot of money just really pointing in the, in the same direction uh, all at the same time that created this huge pop. And then on top of that, you know, let's not short sell um, <laughs> the science that's going on here. Uh, a lot of the biotech companies that are coming forward have created real innovation and real breakthroughs and pr pr uh, clinical proof of concept in some cases. In some cases, it's still a preclinical science experiment, but the amount of capital that is being thrown at these uh, companies is, you know, one of these situations where it's very hard for them to fail to, to bring and uh, get to the next level uh, of development. Um, maybe, uh, Chandra, from a VC perspective, you can, you can comment as well in terms of what you've seen in terms of how you guys are looking at the market. Yes, yeah, sure. Uh, the audio okay now? Better. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. No, I think, uh, Gil, you you really hit the nail on the head with the self-fulfilling prophecy. So I think um, you and, and many biotech companies, particularly in the U.S., have been doing a good job at creating this dynamic where basically people are worried that they can make it into the IPO, and in order to be in the IPO, you actually have to be in the crossover, and even to be in the crossover, you want to sort of build that relationship earlier on, and all along these companies are so well financed that they may not desperately need any of these financing events. Uh, so I think uh, there's been this, um, uh, this whole dynamic that's been uh, going on in a lot of US IPOs that we're seeing. Uh, I'm not sure how long it will last because as mentioned, it's partly also driven by the interests of generalists or at least sort of investors who historically may have not played such a strong role in uh, biotech IPOs. Uh, and if that changes and maybe the dynamic also changes but um, but yeah it, it certainly creates a lot of angst on the part of some investors how, how do we make it into these hot deals i'm gonna just uh, jump in there quickly one question maybe for gil and then generally a question for perhaps the panel wants to talk about C clearly there, there have been a couple of ipos i can't i can't tell you exactly how many where investors have a lot of investors have put in orders and that haven't been fulfilled because it's just gone to a select group. 
So perhaps maybe you know well, is that is that a, is that something where that we need to really worry about because that eventually um, kind of backfires. And then perhaps a related question, you know, having lived th th through I don't know how many ups and downs now. I'm looking at the XBI now. The, at least at least two on the XBI and three or four on Nasdaq biotech. Um, when when there is this kind of hot money, if you want to call it that, it always ends up in tears. And, and you know, it's been a while since we've been talking about, oh, this is going to end in tears, and and it hasn't. Um, so really, are we? And and I hate to use that phrase because I get shot at every time I use it. Are we? Are we going through a paradigm shift in terms of? In terms of people's attitude to biotech, that, that they've accepted that this is that these are not just fly-by-night companies, um, or whatever the right phrase is, um, fly-by-wire, um, and that they, they, they really are creating value. Just just thought that because I, I do wonder myself quite a bit. <clears throat> Sorry, Sam. The, the <laughs> first one <laughs> I didn't write down the first question. Oh, no, about the select group of investors. The impact of uh, yes. right, yeah. right, yes, right, right, right. So I'd say, listen, that, that, that sometimes is a concern. Um, the advent of the crossover market is to help really very deep pocketed investors get ownership percentages that matter. And some of the funds have become so big, Sam, that, you know, for them to put in a $10 million order on an IPO and, for, you know, maybe that's inflated, maybe that's not. And, you know, to get $2 million in allocation at the end of the day on a $100 million deal, that just doesn't make sense for a lot of them, you know, given the time that they invest. So the crossover provides them an opportunity to really deploy an amount of capital that you can really make a difference. And if you're going to do the work on a certain company, you want to put some real um, money behind that. So that I think is continuing to drive the market. As you look at the initial public offering uh, allocations, uh, at least in the deals that we have um, done, by and large, 80, 85% of the book of demand goes to the top 10, top 15 investors, depending on how long only focused they are. And we try to do a lot of work to make sure that these investors are very you know, long-term dated and they're not going to just flip the deal you know, when the stock is up 2x and they should be there for the next event. Uh, to finance the company. And I think that's probably the most important point is, you know, there are some of these deals that just 3% goes to retail and it all gets jammed into the same investors that were in the last round. As that company comes forward for the next follow on and the next follow on, are all of those investors going to be around the table to continue to finance the company? And what is the pitfall of getting 25, 30 investors to pick up a pencil, do real due diligence, talk to key opinion leaders, talk to intellectual property lawyers, get confident to go ahead and place an order and then go ahead and get zero, right? There's only so many times that they can go ahead and do that. So I think there needs to be a bit of a balance, but at the same time, you know, if those core group of investors have committed to finance this company into the next you know, stratosphere of development, two or three financings beyond, and I think, you know, it could certainly survive, um, you know, to live another day. More often than not, Sam, the first IPO, uh, you know, $100 million deal, after a few days, the liquidity dries up a bit and you don't have too much liquidity in any event, right? So these uh, transactions, which are shoved even more so uh, into, uh, into uh, these investors are really uh, driving that as well. Um, Shana, did you want to talk a little bit about the paradigm shift? Yeah, I mean, I think in the end for us, the for us as an industry, we need to deliver uh, good clinical data and then benefits to patients and society. So it would be nice to think that uh, we are we collectively have become much better. Just, I'm not sure whether it's the case. Uh, certainly, there there is sort of great clinical data coming through uh, all the time. But uh, some of the maybe concerning development is that we see very early stage companies with high valuations that uh, basically do an IPO and then the lockup expires and uh, the investors sort of get out of the IPO with a maybe large return, but the clinical data have not materialized even. So, so in that sense, um, I mean, we at HBM certainly have missed out on some investment opportunities where we fundamentally did not believe in the clinical story. And then looking back, uh, there's the question, well, should we have been part of that IPO and we could have uh, made a nice return and gotten out again? But I think that's, that's cynical. And in a way, um, all of these companies will face uh, sort of the, the clinical data question at some point. So, so I, think, I think we were well advised to really focus on, on what is the ultimate benefit uh, for patients and, and, uh, and not sort of look for the 
short-term financial return only uh, because um, that may not, uh, I think that on that level, that's not a paradigm shift that may be more of a temporary development. And, and on that paradigm shift, Sam, I'd say, and again, I made the comment earlier, you know, for the last 20 years uh, as an investment banker in this industry, I continue to say, to see, I don't know if it's a Moore's Law type event, but really exponential growth in our level of understanding of the scientific basis for disease and the mechanistic uh, realities that we need to digest in terms of how to address some of these uh, diseases and disorders. And I think today it's at an all time high, right? Um, confidence that investors can gain in terms of what that looks like after the clinical study uh, is pretty significant. And that I think is driving a lot of the investment uh, based on you know folks trying to make a good inference. Can you reproduce the data that you had here in phase two into phase three? And there have been a lot of successes. Uh, and when they work, you see acquisitions to the tune of $20 billion. Um, and, and those numbers are absolutely astronomical. Um, and it's very hard for some of the big farmers to compete in that context. But notwithstanding that, we see this trend continuing where enormous, enormous prices are paid on a, on a you know, say multiple to peak sales for each company. Uh, and again, from a scarcity value perspective. So once you get your product approved, um, there are a ton of you know, buyers out there for that uh, asset. And therefore, you know, that even uh, you know, with high valuations in the preclinical realm, if you think about you know, 500 million market cap company versus a 400 or even a 300 million market cap company at IPO, if you're selling for 20 billion 10 years down the line, you know, I'm not sure anybody really remembers whether it's 400 or 500. I think that people are actually, you know, if it works, it's going to be explosive. And that kind of risk return, um, you really can't see in any other industry other than oil and gas, uh, potentially, right? Yeah, I agree, agree. Yeah, excellent comments. Before we move on to sort of partnering in M&A, is the message for your, for our, you know, audience where we have private European biotech companies, is the message to prepare yourselves for your, for the U.S.? I think the message is broaden your awareness and meet with as many investors as you can. Uh, identify, uh, you know, the real key salient highlights in your business uh, and drive that message and execute. Uh, meet with an investor, highlight what you're going to do over the next six months, go see them six months later, highlight exactly that you've executed all of that and, and build that credibility. Um, the world has become a lot closer than it was in the past for our European brethren here, where historically, you know, 15 grand and a couple of nights in a hotel in New York could yield you maybe three or four meetings. Now you can do that in a single day uh, and, and really utilize this platform that's been created for us to broaden the awareness of your company and meet as many investors as you can. Uh, and that execution of continuously meeting them, that will be, you know, will serve volumes into the future as you look to finance, because it's very difficult to meet on day one uh, and have Chandra write you a check on day two. Uh, you know, you need to make sure that uh, the investors, especially, you know, if you're relatively unknown or if it's new science or if it's early, that you gain some early investor support uh, and, and use that to bridge into additional new long-term investors. But I think long-term, the capital markets are much more efficient in the U.S. There are some pitfalls that exist on Euronext and in the Scandinavian market um, and really in, in every jurisdiction in Europe, uh, as I've been working out here for the last 11 years. And the U.S. really provides the greatest amount of capital uh, to be able to compete and run the right uh, clinical studies. Uh, and that, I think, is what's the key is make sure you have enough money to, to get the right data and that you don't have to cut corners because you weren't able to raise uh, enough enough money and you have to end up doing your study in a, in a, in a prison in Russia uh, because that's what you can afford versus you know a, a double blind placebo control study in the, in the Western market uh, under a US ID. Uh, yeah. that's, that's, that's pretty differentiating. And Karen, that's been pretty transformational for Amrit, hasn't it? Yeah, you know, we, we, we came to market in on the A market in London in, in 2016. And, you know, to Gil's point, you know, some of the European markets come with their challenges, never a great place to be. We, you know, clearly spent a lot of time talking to, to the investment community in London, but, you know, whenever people would talk to me, I would, you know, make it clear that our focus has always been on the US. We've always been very driven by the US markets and the opportunity to, 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 to list on NASDAQ. We, we, we finally pulled that off. Um, Earlier this year in July, we didn't actually have a, a fundraise IPO. We just did a straightforward listing because we have, you know, 
we're, we are in that, um, I guess, fortunate position to, to have quite a bit of cash already on our balance sheet. We're revenue generating as a business. So there was no absolute need to uh, to go out there and raise additional cash at that, at, at that juncture. You know, clearly at some, at some future date, that's something that we, we will want to do. And, it, you know, one of, the, one of the positives for us is, again, you know, we saw on that positive data for for our phase three study quite a significant uptick in our in our stock price on both nasdaq and also in in london so you know i'd say to all all european biotechs listening to this that you know you need to be you know you need to be thinking about the u.s market you need to be thinking not only in terms of the opportunity your assets on the u.s market but actually raising capital you need to go to whether you know the capital markets are king and you know is that europe probably not at this point in time it always has been the us thank you um maybe we should we've got about 20 minutes left why don't we just talk a little bit about partnering in MA? um valentine if i could have those couple next slides this is just um, pharmaceutical licensing activity um annualized and in interestingly it's pretty much um, business as usual, as Eve had mentioned, um, uh, that there's quite a lot of, uh, this is kind of the bread and butter business of both the pharmaceutical and the biotech space. And if I could just look at the next slide. M&A, um, on the other hand, um, has, been, has been until recently challenging <clears throat> in the first and second quarter. As you can see in 2019, of course, it was a record year with uh, both in terms of, uh, you know, throughout the course of the year, a lot of, you know, very large transactions. And then during the sort of COVID, uh, the height of the COVID situation in the first and second quarter, volume dropped down quite significantly. Um, if we could just have the next slide, Valentin. More recently, of course, we've seen a very large pickup. Um, so uh, that's just a little bit of background. Um, obviously, the biggest deal of the year, just done about a week ago. Um, maybe if we could put the slides down um, now. Oh yeah, in the top 10, thank you, Valentine. <laughs> Sorry, I forgot about those. Interestingly though, the top 10 um, last year, uh, the top 10 was, the bottom of the top 10, you know, was kind of in the middle of <laughs> this year's. So Immunomedics is, you know, 21 billion-ish, um, but uh, a, a deal of about a billion dollars would not make, would not have made it into the top 10 last year. Um, if you could put the slides down, then we would, just talk. I mean, Eve, you were saying, you know, business, pretty much business as usual on the on the on the partnering side. How long can that go on? And are you thinking of new ways? You know, we all have a sort of a <clears throat> kind of, if you will, pipeline of relationships. And, you know, we've known people for 20, 30 years. People move around. You have this kind of network. Um, how long can this go on? Or will you look for new ways to? Well, I, I think the, the, the new ways I was mentioning before are more the practical way to getting connection, connected with other people. I, I don't see any, any reason why the new technologies and, and the digitalization would um, make us have to work completely different. And I, I think uh, just like you, you showed on the previous slide with the M&A, activities uh, i can say that from our side there is not no purposely delay in, in in shifting deals backwards or or delaying them for for any particular reason it, i think it's just the way they, they just keep coming the way they kept coming for for the, for the last couple of years um i think one of the trends i, I do notice over the last uh couple of years and 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 definitely not uh, decelerating currently is that through through all the money that is out we do notice that companies have less of a need to partner and that um, where a couple of years ago companies would reach out because they they needed money or they didn't have the money to bring the product or the development to the next phase you do notice now that money often is not an issue and that that discussion is shifting to uh, experience that they're often needing the experience or the capacity or the the, the 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 capabilities to to bring it to the next phase more than 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 the money, and and then I think just from from a premiums point of view, um, you, you do see that premiums are high and remain high and probably are even trending up higher uh, to to execute the deal. And and it's clearly that the COVID crisis has not pushed uh, any of the premiums that that we see. Are being paid uh, any any down, and I think it's a trend probably that will continue uh, for the for the next couple quarters uh, to come, in my opinion. 
Chandra, do you have, um, when you think about one of your portfolio companies <clears throat> in a market like this, uh, do you think you need to take it public first before thinking about M and A, or do you do you do you think one or the other just based on how the market is or the the dynamic? Yeah, I mean, so we've uh, of course expected that M and A and IPO options would uh, be drastically reduced when we uh, all entered the COVID nineteen crisis in the early part of this year, and then what we've actually seen is that in the first nine months of 2020, uh, we have seen uh, so far nine uh, exits, five IPOs and four M&A transactions from our portfolio. Actually five if you count the uh, company that first went public and was then acquired. So two of the companies on your top 10 list there came from our portfolio. Um, and so I'm not sure whether there is a right answer for, for uh, sort of companies in general. I think companies that can afford to do to dual track, then that's of course a good thing. But I think with the current availability of um, uh, IPO funding, uh, that is the path that you can control yourself, whereas uh, M&A is of course obviously what, what depends on, on the uh, sort of strategic interest in your company, uh, which may not coincide with the ability to do an IPO. So I think that's why why more companies are maybe moving down the IPO path uh, to the extent that they're able to do this. Companies are certainly flush with cash on the pharma side too, right? I mean, um, there's no, you know, uh, there's a lot of excess capital. There's a lot of debt capacity. When you look at, um, you know, how how they continue to think about their pipeline skill, do you think? Um, that will lead to increased activity this year. Although I, I know you said you didn't want to have a crystal ball until after no, before November. <laughs> well, uh, listen, I think there's there, there's there's two types of acquirers on the page that you showed. There, there are those that um, are, are okay to pay two billion dollars plus uh, and be one hundred percent right, and then there's others that you know will take a flyer at earlier stage development and do more kind of structured deals. Um, I think that that continues to be the preference in our discussions with large pharmaceutical companies. They'd rather, um, you know, pay as you go in a number of those situations, um, unless there's an absolute need to go ahead and buy it. And even in, in those cases, you know, we're in the middle of a few processes right now where, you know, at certain levels, people are just fine to let it go and they're not going to go ahead and, and, and pay some significant value for that. And I think, you know, when you get north of 10 billion, that's where you see the real de-risked event of the products already approved or, um, you know, it's, it's post a massive de-risking uh, effort. Uh, you know, I think to, to Chandra's point, I, I, every company is a bit different. You know, our, our philosophy remains that you should build your company to build your company, um, raise the capital that you need to run the right clinical studies uh, and establish a strategy to take it alone. Um, the moment you immediately think that you're going to try to sell it after phase two, it you know, becomes you know, a very difficult reality. And companies are bought, they're not sold. So while you continue to pursue your path to build your company and finance it, there's nothing wrong with having you know, a nice conversation with Jansen on the side and educating them on what it is that you're doing. Or, you know, speaking to the guys at Amrit, for example, in, in, in the orphan disease space and saying, this is what we're working on. But I'm not for sale. Um, but at the same time, if somebody wants to knock on the door and provide an interesting offer, I think everybody's, you know, uh, got shareholders and is willing to listen. So, you know, I think that's the best strategy uh, to take on. And in that context, I think you're seeing um, acquisitions come forward. It, it, look at the page that you put up, Stephanie, and make too much uh, rationale, you know, in terms of the overall cycle, it is taking a little bit longer uh, to execute the due diligence. Uh, there's a few processes that we're involved with where contract negotiations are also taking a little bit longer. You're not really sitting in, you know, uh, at one place anymore, and there's a lot of back and forth. But, you know, I think as uh, we get into this new reality, I, I, I still see a significant amount of M&A uh, in the future. Uh, but I think a lot of it's going to come more from a de-risk perspective as, as companies make massive milestones versus, you know, just trying to go ahead and sell yourself after phase two A. Um, just, just a I couple, think, um, sorry, Chandra, go ahead. No, is that good? No, no, I mean, when people, there were a lot of eyebrows that were raised, just like mine, <laughs> when um, the Gilead Immunomedics announcement came, you know, wow, what a number, oh my God. And it, and it reminded me so much of when um, AbbVie bought Pharmacyclics. Uh, it was roughly the same number, um, 
you know, the drug had actually been approved, I think, at the time already. And now four years on, five years on, you know, it, it's, I don't think anyone's going to argue with the, the return that, that the company is going to get from that. But of course, I'm not saying this will be the same, but the reality is that it took six months for Gilead, apparently, when you, from what I remember, Gil, correct me if I'm wrong, that the conversation started perhaps around January, February time, where the stock was $20. And you look at the chart and you go, why didn't you buy it at 20? But there's a lot of difference between what we know about the drug that Immunomedics has today, especially after ESMO, than we did before or at that time. So th th there is an element of, of obviously negotiating. Then you've got COVID on top of that. So you're going to have to, I'm, I'm assuming, make a conviction um, uh, um, position on it and, um, and just go for it. So you know whether 20 was the right number or 21 or 18 or whatever i don't know but i'm pretty sure that um whoever was negotiating on immunomedic side did a pretty good job too but at the end of the day during this process value has been added to that asset and we can argue how much but value has been added to that asset mm -hmm. i was just going to comment uh, that of course sort of a pharma m and a there are other ways of interacting with uh, pharma companies and so I think one example is the role of uh, corporate investors uh, in companies. And I think that's uh, very important. I think also for us as a financially motivated investor, uh, working with uh, teams like uh, Novartis Venture Fund or SR1 is incredibly helpful, I think, both for us as, as investors, but also for the companies through the additional insights and connections that uh, companies gain. Uh, and then secondly, of course, uh, to the extent that companies have either a platform or a broader pipeline, uh, they can engage in collaborations around uh, uh, earlier assets or, or parts of their platform. And one example is the targeted protein degradation space, very active space over the last year, uh, with several, probably half a dozen uh, companies now uh, either IPO'd or on the way to an IPO. Uh, and most of these companies have engaged in one or more pharma transactions without giving away uh, all of the value. So I think uh, I think there are some other ways of uh, accessing pharma validation and pharma money uh, and uh, pharma networks without uh, without selling the company as a whole. So so we have five minutes left, and maybe um, Valentin, if I could just have the next couple of slides, um, just on uh, which is on private financing, just to say that the last two quarters, um, you know, have raised together probably the largest amount of private financing that we've seen in any two quarters. And if I just have the next slide, please. Um, and just that there's been a huge amount of money that's gone into the venture capital space. So this chart was done just as of April, and I'm, I'm sorry, I haven't updated it, but that was 2020 year to date, 14 billion um, of, of new money into the venture, venture capital uh, arena, which as uh, you can see is quite a lot more than has been happening in the past. Um, thank you, Valentine, you could take the slides off. Um, Chandra, what opportunities and what challenges does this pose, this sort of situation? Yeah, I mean, we have a unique uh, situation at HBM that we are an evergreen fund, so we're we're not raising funds every four or five years, and that also means that we, we're not under pressure to uh, invest. I mean, if we wanted to basically do no new investments for a year, then we could do that, and if we wanted to um, a dozen new investments a year, which, which we've done for the last few years, and, and we've already done that for this year as well, uh, then we can also do that. But uh, I think the situation may be different for some funds that have, uh, I mean, if you raise $500 million and you say there are all these hot opportunities out there uh, and then you sit on that money for six months, then your investors may well sort of come back to you and say, okay, so what, what did you tell us before and why are you not investing now? So so I think there's a bit of an element here of um, uh, some large funds uh, being also under pressure to deploy money. That's of course good for, for the smaller companies or for the startup companies that can absorb that money. But it may also sometimes um, lead to an environment where we see high valuations. And I think everybody needs to realize that having a privately uh, pre clinical company with uh, a $500 million valuation, that is not a success in itself. I mean, it actually may create more problems than benefits for everybody down the line. So um, I think uh, to the extent there are some of these excesses, I think they, they may be corrected uh, in, the, in the future. But uh, for the industry, it's of course good to have that money around. Any other thoughts on that question before we call it a day, so to speak? Any, 
and any um, any questions from the audience? I think uh, we should be about finished then. Um, well, that just leaves it for me to say thank you very much um, to all of the panelists. I think it was a really interesting discussion and um, uh, we'll all see how the world evolves, especially after November um, but, uh, and, and, and uh, how the COVID world evolves. But thank you all very much for taking the time and uh, sharing your thoughts and uh, we'll look forward to the next panel. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Excellent. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.